Well, welcome to lecture 17 in social neuroscience, and we're going to be covering us versus them. Um, and us and them is sometimes also referred to in social psychology as prejudice, discrimination, stereotyping. So we have a lot to cover in these next two lectures. And in fact, a lot of the information that you might normally associate with prejudice and discrimination is going to come up again and again in subsequent lectures and also in subsequent readings in Sapolsky. So these two lectures, uh, lecture 17 and 18, correspond to chapter 11 in Sapolsky's Behave. Now, this topic of us and them is really full of, um, you know, violent um, actions. It's also discrimination. It can be involved with uh, simple words that we say to each other. This is a really big sort of problem, socially speaking, in terms of what humans do to others. And so what I'm going to do is start out this lecture with some really basic processes. We're going to look at things like face processing and eye gaze and how that might contribute to our eventual categorization of people into in and out groups. Then we'll talk about how we make attributions about other people in terms of their behaviors. We'll talk about categorization, stereotypes, and then finally how we learn stereotypes and our fears about people we let designate as them. All right, let's take that first step of when you encounter another person, one of the first things you're gonna look at when you see that other person is their face. And as you look at their face, one of the things you pay attention to in another person is their eye gaze. So this is one of the most basic things that we're doing socially is looking at other people's eyes and understanding their eye gaze. Before I go on, I just want to point out that a tutor in this course in 2022, Katie McKay, has published an outstanding um, paper in Psychological Bulletin, which is one of our premier journals in psychology, in which during her honors thesis, she did a big meta-analysis on looking at eye gaze in terms of how it affects our attention. And so if you're interested in this topic and want to look at it in more detail, you can see um, this reference here. You'll notice that down in the lower left, that kind of shows you how a lot of these eye gaze studies are done, where you can have um, your participant paying attention to a stimulus on the screen, like a, a fixation cross. And then there is a um, face presented to you and the eyes are looking to the left or looking to the right. And then there's a target presented. And the idea is, does where that person is looking affect your subsequent attention? And of course it would, but this is nice uh, research that actually shows exactly how this works. So um, I wanted you to know that that paper exists. Now we're going to move on though and talk a little bit more about when we see someone's eyes looking to the left or the right, we're also going to be paying attention when they're looking directly at us. And so that's the notion of looking at direct versus averted gaze. Um, so what is the significance of someone looking directly at you? That means that they're the object of your attention, right? So if someone looks right at you, you know that they're paying attention to you. And this could have some significance. It could affect whether or not you want to approach or avoid the person. It maybe comes into play when we're talking about ba basic social categories about whether or not this is a person in our group. Um, it might have something to do with fighting or fleeing or reproduction then. Um, you know, if someone's making direct gaze with you, it might be suggest that the person actually likes you, um, is attracted to you. When you look at someone though and they avert their gaze, that could tell you that, hey, I don't want to have any contact with you. I don't like looking at you, I, whatever. The averted gaze also has a lot of meaning, right? And all of this stuff about direct versus averted gaze is also going to be affected by friendship and whether or not you have a reciprocal relationship with this person. Do you plan to gaze your eyes back at them? Okay. So eye gaze is really quite fascinating. This is a very initial, sub, subtle little um, thing that's going on there when we talk about social behavior. And so there's a lot about significance of this eye gaze is going to depend on who the other person is and your history of interaction with them, right? So we do respond differently to eye gaze and aversion based on our history with different people. Is this a friend or is this a foe? Is this someone who's our relation or not our relation, kin or non-kin? And how close are we to this person? Also, another thing it could distinguish uh, how you're gonna respond is whether or not the person's older than you or younger than you or someone who's the same age as you or whether or not that person has higher or lower status. So eye gaze really has a lot that's being conveyed to us um, in that brief moment when we first make eye contact or not. The significance also depends on the state of that other person. For instance, if you have someone's eye gaze and they're looking directly at you and they look angry, that's going to mean something different when they look at you and they have a smile on their face, right? So 
again, we're taking into a lot of a lot of information coming in very quickly as we look at that face and pay attention to where their eyes are. Gaze direction also, by the way, can indicate things like our focus of attention. You know, so when I look at your eye gaze and see where you're looking, it helps me figure out what you're paying attention to. So if you're talking to me and suddenly your eyes look over off to the left, I might want to go and look over at the left too and see if there's something over there we both need to be paying attention to. Interestingly, dogs do this as well. Dogs are actually able to pay attention to our eye gaze and perhaps because of our um, the way that we've uh, allowed dogs to become domesticated and to they've evolved to be our companions that they've learned to pay attention to our eye gaze. Another way that eye gaze matters is it helps with reference and language. So when we're talking about people or objects um, and we, we use our eyes as we're talking to people to let them know what we're referring to that might be around us. So for example, here's a, a famous movie, a Rear Window, um, Alfred Hitchcock, and there's Jimmy Stewart. And he's talking about something he's seeing across the way behind his apartment. Um, and so as he's doing that, you can tell as he's talking what he's looking at. Um, you can also infer de desire or motivation from someone's eye gaze, like this famous example of this woman walking down a street in Italy. And you can see the men um, looking at her um, and having responses on their face as they make eye contact or try to make contact. And when we um, also look at people's eyes gaze, we can kind of figure out some of their goals and intentions. So for example, here in this photo, we can see these two athletes are focused on that goal, that ball. They both want to get to it. And also you can think of eye gaze as telling us a little bit about whether or not that person's being thoughtful or reflecting, or they're having some sort of concentration as they think about it. So there's a lot to pick up from eye gaze, this really quick cue that we have when we, when we encounter another person. So how does the brain process gaze direction? Well, we're not the only species that really cares so much about gaze direction. There's a lot of other primates out there that also pay attention to eye gaze. And we know from working with monkeys and doing research with these other primates that some of the other cues that matter in terms of interpreting eye gaze is where the body is oriented, how the head is oriented, and also where the eyes are focused. So what I mean by that is that I turn my head and look at the, at the camera versus this way or like that or down like this, you can see that my body, my head is orienting. And so all of that is coming into play as we try to make sense of my eye gaze as I look at you in this lecture. So like I said, a lot of this work has been done with non-human primates. It's done with single cell recordings, looking at things like direction and intention. They've done lesion studies. Um, there's fMRI studies. We know quite a bit about how eye gaze works in the brain. And what we know is that the superior temporal sulcus is going to be quite important in eye gaze and understanding eye gaze. We also know that the amygdala is really important, especially in monkeys. Um, monkeys are very um, prone to understanding and paying attention to eye gaze. And in fact, um, they, uh, they have sort of like implicit rules about how they should respond to each other based on their social hierarchy in, in, in eye gaze. So it turns out that amygdala activation is quite important in processing eye gaze in monkeys. And it might have something to do with their emotional significance of their rank in terms of their dominance. Now, what about in humans? What do we know about eye gaze there? Well, there's a lot of studies in humans as well. Um, I just thought this is a fun study to tell you about that was published in 2018, where you can see the title is Perception of Direct Versus Averted Gaze in Portrait Paintings. And so they actually took uh, photographs of famous paintings that have been around for hundreds of years, both classic art and also more modern art, and where there are faces and people are looking at the person making the, you know, painting the portrait or their eyes are averted and asked the question is, do, you know, do we process those paintings differently when we have direct versus averted eye gaze? And so here's an example of one of those paintings. Now that circle and the red and all that has been added on by the researchers because what they're doing is they're taking a painting like this where you have a direct gaze and they're going to look at in an eye tracking part of their study, they actually keep track of where the eyes uh, of the participant are when they're looking at this. And they come up with these areas of interest that you can see, like there's a red area of interest there that would be um, when they're looking at their eyes. The green means that they're looking at the mouth area. And so what, and the yellow is just the overall um, face. And what they wanted to see is, does the um, gaze affect where the person looking at the painting spends their time gazing at the picture? And you can see there that on the left part of that graph, that when people look at a painting with direct eye gaze, they actually spend more time looking at the eyes 
than when they have averted eyes. So in this sort of fairly straightforward study where you're just looking at a painting of someone making direct eye gaze or not, you end up spending more time as a viewer of those that painting of that painting's eyes than you would if the eyes are averted. You can see that in the face, just generally it doesn't seem to affect where you look at the face, um, whether the eyes are averted or not. And then down at the mouth, you can see you get a little bit more activity. It's actually significant um, when the person's making uh, in the painting is making a direct eye gaze. Um, you actually spend a little more time looking at the mouth as well uh, versus when it's averted. So that direct eye gaze is just sort of suggesting again, just even from these paintings, that we pay more attention then to the face or pay more attention to the eyes and the mouth when we're getting that direct contact and that direct eye gaze. Now in that study, they also did this in the fMRI. So they scanned um, the you know, participants' brains while they're looking at these paintings. And they did find differences for direct versus averted gaze um, activation. And they found that basically more direct gaze gave you more activity in the fusiform face area, the TPJ, the inferior frontal gyrus, and the DLPFC. So all areas that we kind of associate with processing faces, theory of mind, processing other people, those all became more activated when you had direct eye gaze versus averted gaze. So on this, on this one study from looking at paintings, you can tell that we put a lot more meaning into people who are giving us direct gaze versus averted gaze, at least in terms of trying to understand them socially, all right? Now, in terms of trying to understand people socially, that leads us to our next topic for today, which is making attributions about other people. Now, making attributions is an old classic social psychology type of question. Attribution theory was um, research that was done in the 50s, 60s, and 70s in social psychology that had to do with how do we go about explaining other people's behaviors? And where we sort of ended up with that uh, research was this sort of classic social psychology model, which is that basically we make inferences or make attributions about other people by looking at their behaviors, like how they're behaving, and then we quickly make a dispositional characterization. So our sort of automatic thing that we do is all in red there, is that we look at behaviors like we say, oh, there's just an aggressive behavior. Oh, he just said something insulting. Oh, they just did something helpful. And then right away, the first thing we do to try to explain that is come up with a dispositional characterization, which means that we try to explain that person's behavior in terms of some trait about them or some aspect of who they are, rather than trying to explain it from like a situational perspective. So we tend to like come up with very quick attributions that are automatic that have to do with what we think of in terms of that person's trait, their groups that they belong to, that kind of thing. But that's what we do automatically. If we are motivated, we have the time and, you know, it's, it's not too costly for us to do so, we will go back and make situational corrections as we get more information. So we might be, for example, see someone do something aggressive and immediately think, oh, that's a hostile person, that's an aggressive person. And then we later find out that maybe there's some information we didn't know about before, like that person had just hit that other person. And so the reason why the, the second person is hitting the first person is because it's just a response to being hit. Um, so that situational correction might be that we'd say, oh, they're not normally aggressive. They're not normally um, going to hit somebody, but because they've been provoked, they were hitting back, right? So that would be our situational correction. But that would only be that stuff that's in green. That's more of a control process where we have more time, more ability to actually make a situational correction. But for most of the stuff what we're doing is we're just going around and quickly making dispositional characterizations about people on the merest little bits of behavior. Now, when I say behavior, you could also get it down to just like our first impressions of the person. Just seeing their face could be a behavioral categorization that we then lead to a dispositional characterization. And so that leads me to this question. Can we just look at someone's face and make a judgment about whether or not they're trustworthy? So we have a bunch of characters here from the Marvel Universe, and you might know a lot about them, but let's say you're somebody who don't know anything about these particular characters. And you might say, who are the ones that you think you could trust here? And who are the ones you don't think you could trust? Is that something that you could actually make a judgment about just based on these faces that you see here? And that's actually where we get to this research by Alexander Todorov, who's at Princeton University. He's done a lot of research on how we make 
very quick initial judgments about people's trustworthiness without even knowing much about them at all, like without knowing anything that would make us think that we could trust them, we are quick to make judgments about trustworthiness. And you can see here's a paper that they published in Psychological Science where they're saying you can make up your mind after 100 milliseconds exposure to a face. Now you might say, well, how do we know something is a trustworthy face? Now this face that you see right now, that's a very trustworthy face. And as we keep watching the time change here and the negative numbers start to appear, that's more of a untrustworthy face. And you can see that there's certain characteristics in the face that are changing. And as they change, that affects people's judgments about whether or not you think you can trust the person's face. Well, in this study in 2006, they flashed pictures of faces there for either 100 milliseconds, 500 milliseconds, or 1,000 milliseconds. And you can see that one of those um, judgments there is trustworthiness. And trustworthiness actually is able to be figured out within 100 milliseconds. And as the time goes on to 500 and 1,000 milliseconds, people don't really change their judgments of trustworthy very, very much. Trustworthiness is something that we kind of quickly characterize and then sort of it sticks. We just keep um, with our judgment about whether or not a person's trustworthy. Here's another example of this kind of research about how quick we are to make judgments about trustworthiness. This is a study by Winston et al. published in Nature Neuroscience in 2002. And what they did is they had participants in an fMRI scanner view 140, 120 photos of faces like these ones that you see here. And what these photos were actually from were from like uh, yearbooks, American high school yearbooks. And so the question would be uh, for the participant is they were told every time you see one of these pictures, we want you to say is to make this judgment, is this a high school or a university student? Some universities also have yearbook photos. So you're looking at each one of those faces one at a time and you're going to um, make a judgment, is this a high school student or a university student? And so they're not asking them anything about how trustworthy the person is in the, in the picture, right? So trust here is an implicit task. That is, they're not telling people explicitly to think about trust, but perhaps they'll still be affected by their trustworthiness, even though they're not asked to think about it. For the other half, they're told the, the instruction is, is this face trustworthy or untrustworthy? And so this time, the task would be to look at the photograph and then make a judgment about how trustworthy or not the photograph is. So in this case, the task is explicit about trustworthiness, right? And so you're going to be looking at it and say, is that a trustworthy face or not? We also later rated all 120 photos for different emotions, like how neutral or happy or angry the, the person looked in the face, okay? So you have all these photographs, um, 120 photographs, and what they found is what affected trustworthiness when you looked across the participants who rated how trustworthy the photo is. You can see there's all 120 photographs. And you can see that they've sorted them by the one that had the highest trustworthiness, which would be on the far right. And the photos that are the lowest trustworthiness are down on the left. And you can see that that's just trying to show you that as you go across the 120 pictures, you get more and more trustworthiness. So what correlates with that in terms of emotions on the face? And what they found is that things like anger and happiness are related to judgments. Um, you can see that the angry the person looks, the less trustworthy the person is rated. So there's something about a face that's just a high school photograph from a yearbook that the, if the person just happens to look angry, um, the participant thinks that they look less trustworthy. If they look happier, you can see that um, they look more trustworthy. So if they're kind of a happy looking person, people think they look more trusty. And you can also see that uh, E there is trying to show you that there's a negative correlation um, with sadness. So the sadder the person looks, the more it looks like you couldn't trust them. One thing that didn't affect them was how fear, uh, how much fear they seem to be showing in their face. That wasn't related to trustworthiness. Okay, so those are just sort of like some, some ideas about maybe some other things that people are picking up in the face that affect trustworthiness. Now, what about brain activity that occurred while they looked at these faces? So what we can see here is a figure from the paper that shows us how brain activity was related to trustworthiness ratings. So it turns out that right and left amygdala were both greater for less trustworthy faces. So those untrustworthy faces caused people's right and left amygdala activities to be higher. And you can see that here that um, 
the bars that are the tallest are when you have the lowest trust. You can see that left and right amygdala are down at the bottom. And so if you look at low trustworthy, medium trustworthy, and high trustworthy faces, the lowest ones are the ones that yield the most amygdala activity. Also, interestingly, there is more insel activity, right insel activity for uh, low trustworthy faces. Now, another thing that's interesting is that the fusiform face gyrus also showed more activity for the less trustworthy faces, but to a lesser extent. None of these regions, whether we're talking about the amygdala, the insula, or the fusiform gyrus, none of these regions were affected by that implicit versus explicit task. So you can see that here. That implicit, remember again, is when they're just making judgments about whether or not the person's in high school or at university. Explicit is when they're told to actually think about how trustworthy the person looks in the photograph. And you can see that that task construction doesn't really have any effect, that we still see the low, medium, and high differences in amygdala activity, in the insel activity, regardless of what the instruction is. So that's kind of telling us that even when participants weren't thinking about the trustworthiness, that is, they weren't told to think about trustworthiness, their brains are still processing whether or not that face is trustworthy. And it suggests then that people may be automatically making assessments about faces based on how trustworthy they are. So trustworthiness seems to be a, dis a disposition that we quickly identify about other people without much knowledge here, without taking into account anything about our history or situation with them. We are just very quick to go ahead and make a judgment about how trustworthy they are. And maybe there's a good evolutionary explanation for that. Maybe it's something that helps us to quickly judge when that someone could be potentially dangerous to us. But if we go back to that model of um, how we make attributions in social psychology, remember it said that if we have time though, we can make situational corrections. And so even though we may have automatic judgments about trustworthiness, when we have more situational information, perhaps we will change our initial judgment about that person. This makes me think of Professor Snape, that if you've actually watched um, or read the books about in the Harry Potter, Harry Potter series, you know that um, Snape is somebody that you can't trust. It seems quite scary early on in these books and that, you know, you, you have to fear him. He seems to be against Harry. And it's only later when you learn more and more information about um, Snape, especially near the end of the whole series, that you maybe would then correct your initial judgment. So that's the kind of thing we're talking about here is that perhaps we're making these automatic dispositional characterizations about people, about how trustworthy they are. And we only will change that when we have the time and inclination to take situational information in later. Now, there's something we do really automatically, right? I've just hopefully shown you that we quickly make judgments about whether or not people are trustworthy. I also wanna point out that we make the same kind of distinctions about people's categories. So the question here is, are social categorizations also automatic? So do we automatically categorize people on the basis of race, age, and gender? And the quick answer is, Yes, people do this all the time. We will automatically categorize people on the basis of race, age, and gender. It's another one of those things that we do quickly, making dispositional judgments about people, putting them in categories very, very fast. Now, one of the ways we can see this is in a paper by Ito and Erland. So here's Tiffany Ito at the University of Colorado at Boulder. And you can see this is a paper that they published in 2003 in Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. So in this study, they had mostly white participants viewing photos of black and white male and female targets, okay? So the participants are white, but they're looking at photographs of other white people or black people in the um, study. And their task was either to identify the race or the gender of the photo on each trial. So on each trial, they're told, you know, is this a black or a white person? Is this a male or a female? So they're making quick judgments on each trial based on what, it, what the task tells them to do. Trials were arranged in blocks of five, where one of the trials was the target stimulus, which could be the same as or different as the other four trials. And the study was conducted twice, with the second study controlling for differences in brightness of the faces. So I'll show you a little bit more about this. Now, this is an event-related potential study. So ERPs are being used. And you'll remember that in order to look at ERPs, they record EEG continuously throughout the whole study. So this is what an EEG would look like. You're getting all these EEG um, recordings from all over the scalp. And then you're presenting these pictures, these stimuli over and over again, hundreds of trials, right? 
And so when you have all these trials, you can start to make averages across different kinds of trial types, like whether or not it's a black face or a white face or a male face. Um, and then you start to see whether or not you get these kind of components, these potentials from the ERP. Now, you remember, um, I talked about this in, I think, lecture two, that what do ERPs reflect? Well, they can reflect sensory, motor, and or cognitive events in the brain. They reflect these synchronous and phase-locked activities of large neuronal populations that are engaged in information processing. And then we can talk about specifically about these early components that occur about 100 to 300 milliseconds of time since the stimulus was presented. And these are believed to index, index different kinds of attention. And these components are things like the N100 or the P200 or the N200. All right, so going back to the actual study by Ito and Erlen, what did they find? Well, here's some figures from their paper. And one of the things they discovered was that people showed, these white participants showed larger N100s to black faces than they did to white faces. And you can kind of see that here. If you look carefully in the upper left corner, you can see where they're looking at black targets versus white targets, okay? And so they're showing already at 100 milliseconds, a peak there, a, a bigger response to N100 um, in, the N1, in the N100 to black faces than they are to white faces. This suggests that already at 100 milliseconds then, people are noticing the race of the face, right? So they're already making a differentiation to black faces than they are to white faces. And then you can also see that they have at the P200 that they're larger to blacks than they are to whites. And this is also where they show bigger P200s to male faces than they do to female faces. So it's just 200 milliseconds along. This would be the peak that's pointed down. This is that weird thing about ERPs. They plot the um, positive downwards and the negative goes upwards. So here, that big peak that you see that's pointing downwards is sh showing a bigger peak for black targets and also shows a bigger tar uh, peak for male targets, for male faces. So that's saying that already at 200 milliseconds, we're getting further processing about whether or not this is a male or a black target. I'm sorry, a male or a female target, and also whether or not it's a black or a white target. And then the N200, um, which is the next component that pops back up again, that's going in the upwards direction, that's a negative component. It's larger to females than it is to males. So that's telling us, without anything else going on really in this experiment, that people pay attention to the age and the race of, I'm sorry, this is telling us then that already um, very early on, people are paying attention to race and gender of targets that they look at. They're automatically categorizing people, right? And so they say here in their conclusions of the paper that people attend to gender and race very early on with a slight advantage to race, suggesting that race may be actually happens first, where the effects are as early as 100 milliseconds. So at a tenth of a second, people are already showing brainwave activity differently to um, faces based on the race of the face. They suggest that this is evidence of what they call an American white male norm framework in which white males are considered the default normative value and deviations from this norm draw attention. The reason why they make this conclusion is that other ERP studies had shown that when you show your participants something that's different, that's unexpected, you get these same kinds of effects at N100, that it, the thing that's unexpected is bigger. And so they're kind of saying here that perhaps you're just sort of, uh, as an American, you might be used to seeing pictures of white males all the time. That's your common default network of faces that you see are white males. And so if you see a, fe a female face, that's different from a male face. So that's going to cause you to have a bigger, um, you know, possible uh, uh, N200 or something. And also that if you see a black face, that's different from a white face. And so that's why you're already getting these early attentional effects at the N100. So yes, it looks like social categorization effects like this are happening very, very quickly. And this isn't the only study that's shown this. So that leads us then to stereotypes because it kind of tells us then that perhaps a lot of our responses at the N100 and N200 are actually happening because of beliefs we have about what to expect in the everyday life, right? In everyday world based in our culture. 
And so stereotypes have been something that um, social psychologists have been interested in for decades. And they've measured stereotypes since back in the 1920s, where you get these little pictures of people in your head about what you believe that they're like, right? These different ethnic groups, racial groups, and so on. Stereotypes have had lots of attention in recent decades in social psychology. There's lots of interesting research about stereotypes, whether or not we can change stereotypes and so on. One of the leading contemporary models of stereotypes is this thing called the stereotype content model that was proposed by Susan Fisk, who's a professor in psychology at Princeton University in the U.S., um, and her students. So you can see here they talk about when we encounter another person, we want to know what the goals of the other person are and how effectively the person will pursue those goals. And they, the dimension, one of the dimensions then is called warmth. And this is whether or not that other person's goals are positive or negative with respect to our goals. So positive would mean that basically their goals are, uh, you know, don't hurt our goals. They're going to help us with our goals, that kind of thing. So that's what we mean by positive. Negative would mean that their goals are basically in competition with us. They're going to hurt us with their goals, that kind of thing. Competence has to do with whether or not we think they can actually reach their goals. So it's one thing to have a goal that could be to compete with us or not. It's another thing to say, would they actually be able to do that? So competence, high competence would mean then that the person is really actually capable of reaching their goals. Low competence would be our judgment that no, they're not probably going to reach those goals anyway. All right. So in the stereotype content model, we apply this then to groups and our stereotypes about those groups. And we could have then admiration for some groups based on stereotypes that have to do with the fact that we think that they're high status, that they're not competing with us. So we have we view them as being high in warmth and their um, competence is high as well because we think they can actually accomplish these things. So these would be like the people in our in-group, um, even groups that we consider are close allies, groups that we align with. Okay, that's admiration. Then we can also look at people in terms of our groups in terms of competence being low. So this is where we think that, you know, we their goals are good, they're positive, they don't hurt us, they can actually help us, but they're not particularly um, going to be competent, right? So that means that they're not necessarily going to achieve these things. And it's because they can't achieve them, they have lower status. So this is what uh, Fisk and her colleagues call a paternalistic stereotype. And so an example of this would be like a housewife or elderly people or disabled people. So those groups are considered sort of low status because they're not particularly um, competent in terms of reaching their goals and therefore they're not competitive with us. And then we have what are called the envious stereotypes. This would have to do with groups where um, they have high competence, that is they um, can accomplish things that they want to do, but their warmth is low because their um, goals are negative with respect to us. They're taking away our resources. They're competing with us. And so this is where you would group in people like Asians or Jews or rich people or feminists, because the idea is that if you view those groups as being really quite competent in achieving things, but that their goals are in, in um, competition with your own goals, then you have an envious stereotype. And then finally, we have this contemptuous stereotype where it's basically low and low, where there's low competence judged and low warmth. And so these people have um, goals that are not in congruence with ours, but they're also not very likely to succeed in their goals. And so this would be things like welfare recipients, people like welfare recipients or poor people would be in the contemptuous stereotype bin. So this is just a quick view of this, and they talk about this more in Sapolsky's book, but I wanted to go ahead and tell you about a study that Harris and Fisk did. So Harris was a student of Susan Fisk's in 2006, and Harris published his paper in Psychological Science. He's now at the University of College in London. And so based on the stereotype content model, Harris and Fisk hypothesized that the low competence, low warmth group would be the most dehumanized and elicit the most disgust, okay? Because this low competence group that we don't think can actually reach their goals, and even if they could, their goals are in, uh, sorry, in conflict with our own, they're going to be the most dehumanized, the people that we least revere, and they elicit the most disgust according to the stereotype content model. So in this study, they had Princeton students participate in two different studies. They had 10 in study one, 12 in study two, 
and they looked at stimuli that represented the four quadrants of the stereotype content model. In study one, these four um, quadrants were represented by groups or photos of social groups, whereas in study two, um, the participants were looking at photos of objects. So here's an example of what I'm talking about. Oh, sorry, I should just say they had fMRI scans while they looked at these um, experimental stimuli and some neutral controls. And afterwards, they would rate the pictures on four emotions. How much pride they thought was depicted in the picture, how much envy, how much pity, and how much disgust. So pride would be uh, examples of this high eye quadrant. So you have high competence, high, war high warmth. And so the photos would include middle-class Americans, American Olympic athletes, uh, pictures of the U.S. space shuttle, or the Princeton Tiger statue. These last two would be things that you'd see in study two, objects, not people, right? And so you can see that um, Princeton Tiger statues, because these are Princeton students, and so they're seeing their mascot as a uh, sort of a representation of high and high, okay? And then you can see that the pity group would be people who are low in competence, but high in warmth. This would include elderly people, pictures of disabled people, and then in the um, study two, they would show them objects, again, like a cemetery or a collapsed building were supposed to represent um, low competence and high warmth. And then finally, we have high competence, low warmth. This would be the one that's going to most likely produce envy in participants. This would be rich people, business professionals. And then for object controls, they use stacks of money or sports cars. And then finally, in the last group, the low, low group, this is the group they thought which should elicit disgust because they're the most extreme out group from the in group. This would include homeless people, drug addicts, and then in study two, objects that would represent low competence and low warmth would be things like an overflowing toilet or vomit. Okay. Now, I can't really get into understanding very well the objects part of this study in study two. Um, we'll just have to take it that they did do some pilot testing. They figured out that these particular objects fit into these four categories and were likely to evoke these kinds of emotions. But for now, we can really mainly focus, I guess, on what they uh, did in study one, where they had the participants looking at people who represented these four different groups. So here are the results in the fMRI part. And you can see that they did find that the three groups that were supposed to elicit pride envy and pity did exactly that. So high competence, high warmth, elicited pride, and you can see the brain activity that's involved there. Envy would be um, high competence, low warmth, and you can see the, the rich people um, and so on are, are gonna elicit envy, and you can see the brain activity for that. And then we have the low competence, high warmth group, and they're gonna elicit pity, and you can see the activity we see there. The main thing to point out here is that all three of these quadrants, uh, stimuli from these quadrants, showed activation in the medial prefrontal cortex, which is what's being circled there. So the MPFC is something we've talked about several times in this course, is a part of the brain that's gonna be activated when we're thinking about people, right? So we need to, we see pictures of people here, rich people, people who are poor, people who are whatever. And what we're seeing in this particular case, in these three quadrants, is that you get more medial prefrontal cortex when you look at people in those three particular quadrants. But what about the last quadrant? What about the quadrant that's low, low? We have low competence and low warmth. This is the one that they think is the one that's most dehumanizing, the one that you're most likely gonna feel disgust for. They're most, the most extreme outgroup from the in-group. And so for the low, low group, you can see that when they're looking at people, that's what the um, images up at the top show you. And down at the bottom is when they're looking at objects in study two. The activation here was all in the left insula and the right amygdala, all right? So places where you would expect disgust, the insula and the amygdala were the areas that were activated when people, when these participants looked at pictures of people who represented the low, low quadrant. Interestingly, there was no medial prefrontal cortex. So you can see that in this um, study one there, MPFC is not being activated even though the participants are looking at people. The objects that you see at the bottom there, they're not gonna elicit MPFC either because you don't normally um, show MPFC activity when you look at a picture of money because it doesn't involve people in it. 
But here, the group that's the most extreme, these low warmth, low competent, stereotyped people are the ones that don't even elicit the medial prefrontal cortex in these Princeton students. So that suggests then that stereotypes have an effect on the way we respond to people as people or not, right? So they're, we're going to kind of see them almost as not people. They're, we're dehumanizing them, and therefore we don't even use the parts of the brain that we would normally do. We, instead, we're just thinking of them as perhaps disgusting people, um, disgusting objects. All right, so that's stereotypes and how the stereotype content model has been looked at by Harris and other people. Now, can, this is a different kind of question. Can categorization then and stereotyping lead to shooting the wrong person? So here's where we can start looking at the real world even more so. And this research that I'm going to tell you about was actually inspired by something that happened back in 1999, although there's been many examples in the news, even in recent years, that are like this. But this would be the case of Amado Diallo, who on February 4th, 1999, was on his way home in the Bronx in New York when he was shot and killed by four New York City police officers who had fired a total of 41 rounds at him, hitting him 19 times, okay, and obviously killing him then. Now, the reason why they did this is that they had been driving through this neighborhood in the Bronx looking for a suspected rapist, and one of the police officers saw Diallo and thought that he looked like a rapist that he had seen a year before, and so they pulled over and told Diallo that they you know, to put his hands up. Well, Diallo um, ran a little bit and then he reached for his pocket. And as he reached for his pocket, the cops thought that he was reaching for a gun and they immediately started shooting at him and killed him. Turned out he had no gun, that all he was really doing was reaching for his wallet for some sort of identification. Those four police officers were then later found innocent, that they had followed police procedures, but it did cause the New York City Police Department and a lot of other police departments around the United States to change their procedures about how quickly they were going to fire. Now, that's the story, this horrible story from 1999 that was then um, inspirational to a guy named Josh Carell at, in 2002, who did his work suggesting that such shootings like this happen because of a racial bias. And so what he argued was that perhaps the reason why people respond so quickly why these police officers do this is because of stereotypes that they have about black people and when they see a black person like this on the street they find them more threatening than they would for a white person so they're more quick to respond because of a stereotype and shoot the person so corral erland and ito got together these are the same erland and ito who did that other erp study that i told you about to look at whether or not erps could help us understand this shoot, don't shoot kind of response. They hypothesized that cultural stereotypes associated with whites and blacks in the United States could determine the automatic responses that would then be detected by ERPs. And so you can see here that you do this automatic categorization as we saw already at 100 milliseconds of like whether or not the person's face is white or black. And then they speculated that that would then lead to stereotypes. And for um, whites in the United States, there's not much of a stereotype there of some sort of threat or danger, but for blacks, there might be associations with crime or some sort of danger or aggressiveness in terms of the stereotypes. And so they would expect then that you're going to see a dif differentiation then of threat, low threat versus high threat that they would see around P200. And then this P200 response would then lead to an N200 response that would cause you to shoot or not. So they say here, that if you have a, a low threat, you're going to see a lower P200 that's going to inhibit your shoot response. Whereas if you're looking at a black face and the black face then is associated with threat, it's just going to cause you to have a shoot response. And so then if you then look at the object that the person's holding and you have to decide whether or not to shoot, if it's a non-gun, um, if you're a white person, a uh, white target you're looking at, it's going to facilitate that. It's going to make it more likely that you aren't going to shoot them if they don't have a gun. Whereas if they're a black person and they are reaching for something that could be a gun, then it's going to facilitate your response. And so what they did is they asked these participants to play a video game in which white and black men, half carrying pistols and half carrying an object like a mobile phone, appeared one at a time on a screen. So this picture comes up, it looks like something from a video game. It's either a white person or a black person. They're either carrying a pistol or they're carrying an object like a mobile phone in their hand. 
and the participants told to shoot any on any armed targets by pressing a button or don't shoot for any that were unarmed. So you have to quickly make a distinction. Are you going to shoot this person or not? Do this as quickly as you can. And then the ERPs are recorded during the presentation of each target. Behaviorally, did they see something here? Yes, they actually found this in the original Corral et al. study in 2002, that you can see that if they're unarmed and then they need to decide whether or not they're going to shoot, you can see that they take longer when they're unarmed to make a distinction, just to make a decision to whether or not to shoot. But when they're armed, they're quicker to make a distinction, a decision to shoot. So you can see where it says armed, black, that means that they're deciding to shoot that armed person more quickly when it's a black face than it does a white face. Because the idea is that the stereotype of a black person facilitates this threat sort of stereotype. And then that threat, threat, sort of, that threat stereotype then facilitates a shoot response. Whereas again, for the unarmed person, that's in, 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 in uh, opposition to what you expect about the stereotypes. And so there's like longer here to take, to have a longer response to the uh, making that decision to shoot. Well, they looked at this in terms of the ERPs and you can see here, here's the distinctions that they're looking at the N100, N200 and so on. The N100 was um, affected by whether or not the person was carrying um, a gun or not. And then the P200 and later showed race effects. So people as early as um, 100 milliseconds, the NR, the ARP is showing a difference about whether or not it's a, a mobile phone or a gun, but it takes about 200 milliseconds or so before you see the race effects. And then you can then look to see how those two things interact to make a distinction about whether or not the person shoots. And so they did this through um, a mediational analysis that you can see here where you can look at the cultural stereotype about how much that participant sort of endorsed stereotypes about blacks being more dangerous than whites. And you can see that if they had that cultural stereotype, they were more likely to have that P200 target race effect. And that led them to be able, more likely to shoot um, black faces more. It also was related to the N200 target race effect. And so the authors speculated that perhaps their findings reflect an evolutionary mechanism for detecting threat in the environment, but that culture then may inadvertently teach us through stereotypes about whom and what we have to fear. So the news here is not too good in the sense that once these things are learned, they're happening very quickly. The race of the target and the cultural stereotype about that target come together really quickly and then facilitate maybe shooting somebody um, who may or may not have a weapon as you can see here in, in these particular findings. And so it says that perhaps the only thing we can really do then is work on the stereotypes in the first place, you know, maybe change those stereotypes so that when race does become activated, you're not gonna see this kind of shooter bias. That seems to be what's suggested by this kind of research. By the way, what brain regions are actually involved in social categorization? You'll notice that um, that was just ERP research, but what we know is that probably the face fusiform area is involved in social categorization. And it looks like the amygdala is playing a role in determining outgroup members from in-group members. We'll talk more about this at the next lecture, although I have a little bit of data I can talk about um, in a moment. So let's lead to, this, to our last topic, which is how we learn stereotypes and how we fear them, okay? How we learn all this, because it seems a lot to do with like what culture is teaching us, right? As culture, has histories about different groups. We grow up in this culture and we learn about what different groups are supposed to mean, right? So here's an interesting study that was published by Elizabeth Phelps, who's at New York University, um, was published in 2005 in Science. And what they wanted to look at is how quickly we learn to fear um, people based on social groups. So in experiment one, they had participants view images of fear relevant and fear irrelevant stimuli, okay? And in experiment two, they had them look at black um, and white um, faces, and they had black or white American participants view these faces. In both of those experiments, while they were looking at those faces, they had these acquisition trials. So this was like done in a Pavlovian conditioning style, where a CS plus was paired with a un, um, unconditioned stimulus of shock. So the CS plus is like, where you have um, a snake or a spider being presented, and then it's gonna be followed 
uh, with a shock, right? So it's paired with a shock. The other type of stimulus was not paired with a shock, a CS minus, okay? So that's what CS minus means. You don't have any sh um, shock paired with it. And then it's followed by extinction trials. So as you go through acquisition, you learn that some stimuli are going to be paired with shock. Others are not going to be paired with shock. And then you go through extinction trials where there's no shock presented anymore. And the main dependent variable in the study was skin conductance response. So they're just measuring how much you sweat in your skin. Okay. So in experiment one and in experiment two, you can see the, what happened here with their skin conductance activity. So during acquisition, whatever was fear relevant and fear irrelevant, you can see that the fear relevant stimuli, whatever they are, this is in experiment one, would be like um, spiders and snakes or flowers or whatever it was, that people could um, acquire and learn about those stimuli. Now, fear relevant would be um, things like spiders and snakes. Those are things that we naturally associate with fear. And people are more quick to learn shock pairings with fear relevant CS pluses than they are for fear irrelevant stimuli. So if a CS plus is something fear irrelevant, like flowers, we don't normally associate fear with flowers, you can see that people do learn to fear the flowers to the shock because of the shock pairing there in acquisition um, equally. So the fear relevant and fear irrelevant show the same effects on acquisition. For extinction, this is when they stopped shocking the participants anymore. You can see that very quickly the participants stop showing skin conductor responses to fear irrelevant stimuli. So if it's a flower that they were previously being shocked on, they quickly extinguish that response. They don't show that same fear to flowers anymore. But you can see for fear relevant stimuli like spiders and snakes that, are, that get paired with shock, people still linger on having a skin conductance response uh, when they have um, a presentation of a fear relevant stimulus. So the more interesting thing though is really what happened in experiment two where they had these white and black faces um, being presented to white and black participants. And so if it's an out group, that would mean like, for instance, a white person looking at a black face or a black participant looking at a white face. You can see that during acquisition, they either shock you to the white face and not shock you to the black face, or they shock you to the black face and not to the white face. But if it's a racial out group, um, people learn that more quickly. You can see they have a bigger skin conductance response here to um, racial outgroups being paired with shock than they do when their own in-group is paired with shock. So if it's somebody from their own in-group paired with shock, they do learn to um, have fear during acquisition to their own in-group, but it's easier to do this when it's a racial outgroup. So that suggests that racial outgroups by themselves are just easily more associated with fear. We are able to learn fear easily with a racial outgroup. And then in the extinction trials, which you can see there on the right, is when they stop shocking them again, it takes longer for people to unlearn that response. They're still showing skin conductance responses every time you show them a photograph of a racial outgroup. But for a racial in-group, they pretty much extinguish that very quickly. They don't fear them anymore. So once you learn to fear that facial, racial outgroup, it takes longer to extinguish it. So it's a nice pair of studies there in the sense that they showed the same effects um, in experiment one with things that had nothing to do with race that you could see then with race in experiment two. Um, this is also from that study where they looked at black faces and white faces and regardless of, um, you can see this is where we looked at white participants and black participants just to show you that it seems to be an outgroup phenomenon rather than just a black face or a white face. Now they also talked about the fact that fear conditioning to outgroups was more attenuated, that is it disappeared more, it was smaller for those participants who had had more interracial romantic partners. So that suggests that something about that person's background, like if they had dated interracially, a white person dating a black person or vice versa, um, they were less likely to show these kind of conditioning effects. So perhaps they already had positive experiences with the outgroup that was harder for them to learn how to be um, conditioned to fear here. Let's we'll go back now though to that whole idea about making attributions about others. We've been really going on here about how we quickly make these dispositional characterizations that we um, quickly tell whether or not someone's an in-group or an out-group member. Um, we quickly tell whether or not someone's trustworthy. Do we ever correct these automatic categorizations? Can we go back and situationally correct it? And what's what's Important there is that I'm trying to say is, can we actually sort of undo this 
way that we show these automatic preferences for the in-group and the out-group. So can we learn and unlearn our fears about the out-group? Now here's some interesting paper about this. This is Claudia et al. in 2014, published in the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience. So what they did here is they had 47 white American participants in the Chicago area view photographs of white and black faces while the fMRI was scanned. These participants also completed questionnaires about the racial and ethnic makeup of their social networks at three separate stages of their childhood, from their age from 0 to 6, from 6 to 12, and from 12 to 18. So what you see there is they're trying to look at whether or not these participants come from sort of like racially heterogeneous um, neighborhoods or like they're all like racially homogenous, like if these are all white participants, did they just come from like a white suburb of Chicago, never have any contact with blacks? So that's what they're trying to assess here with these questionnaires. Now, half the photos that they view were viewed before the fMRI scan actually took place to make those photos familiar to the participant. So they chose to have half the photographs become familiarized for the participant, and then the other half would be shown for the very first time while they were in the scanner. During that phase where they learned about those photographs before the fMRI scanner, they even had them memorize each face paired with a letter. And so they would learn like this face goes with the letter L, this face goes with the letter M and so on. And they had to achieve 100% accuracy on a memory task while they were doing this. So the idea was that they wanted to have a subset of these photos, both black and white faces, be something that would be really well learned or really familiarized by the participant. And the other half would be completely novel. So then they go ahead and show these photographs to the participant while they're in the scanner. Again, half the photographs are of white faces, half of them are black. Half of them are novel. This is the first time they've seen the photo. Half of them are the photos they've already seen before in that other task where they had to learn about um, letters being paired with the photo and so on. All right. And what happens? Well, you can see here that they're looking at amygdala activity. This seemed to turn out to be the main thing they paid attention to in this study. So they're looking at left amygdala activity. And you can see that when they're looking at white faces versus black faces, black faces are the dark bars. If it's a novel face, you can see that a novel black face causes them to have more amygdala activity than if it's a black face that they've already been familiarized with. That's the one big significant finding that you see there with left amygdala activity. It didn't really seem to matter very much about whether or not they'd seen the white faces before. So the white faces, whether they were novel or not, doesn't seem to matter. It's more about this effect about novel faces versus familiar black faces. So again, these are white participants looking at outgroup faces. And if it's a novel face they've never seen before, they show more amygdala activity. If it's a outgroup face that they have seen before, it's familiar to them, they don't show as much amygdala activity. Now this difference between novel and familiar was also moderated by how much childhood contact that they had had. And so you can see that down in the B graph here, the B chart, we're looking at the familiar black faces. And you can see that when the participant has not had very much childhood contact with blacks before, they had not had um, interaction with black uh, neighbors, they didn't have very many black people in their social networks, you can see that that distinction between novel black faces and familiar black faces is smaller in terms of amygdala activity. Uh, the amygdala activity is still lower for a familiar black face, but it's just a, you know, a bit lower than it is for a novel black face. But when you go to a medium amount of childhood contact with black people in their lives, you can see that this distinction is even greater, that familiar black faces causes them to have even lower amygdala activity. And when you get to the people in this study who had the most contact with black um, people in their lives growing up, they're the ones that really show this effect of familiarity. So their familiarity, their act amygdala activity is practically nil. There's hardly anything going on here compared to, again, what happens when they look at a novel black face. So one thing that's interesting when you look through these results is that interracial contact between the age of 13 and 18, that third time, of, uh, time period of childhood, was not reliably associated with the reduction of amygdala response to familiar faces. So basically, any contact that you had during your adolescence did not drive these effects. They say that it's possible that the impact of interracial contact during adolescence is overridden by the saliency of negative evaluations culturally associated with black individuals. So what this 
conclusion is suggesting is that what really matters is what's happening between zero and 12 years of age. If those kids between zero and 12 have a lot of contact with people from the outgroup, they're less likely to show these sort of like biases against the outgroup when they're adults in their amygdala for familiar faces than people who only had that kind of contact during adolescence. And the reason why they think that, again, is that perhaps during adolescence, you're just sort of like being um, presented all sorts of cultural things from movies and TV shows and essays and hearing your friends talk about the outgroup, that that is overwhelming. And therefore, any contact you're having with people at that particular time isn't really as important to you as what you're learning from culture. And so um, if you don't get that contact early on, it's not going to really help you very much then in later life in terms of adulthood, at least according to what the results here suggest. So keep in mind, this is all just in Chicago. It's just about white Americans looking at pictures of black Americans and white American faces, right? So we, we don't know how much this is going to generalize, how much this would be affected by other cultures, other historical things are going on all over the world where we have in-groups and out-groups. But it does tell you that, again, contact that happens between childhood and adolescence could have something to do a lot with what people do as adults. So that is where I'm going to leave you at this particular lecture for this half of the topic of us versus them. And so we've talked about face processing and eye gaze and how this very early on, we've got this thing that we're doing, we're already looking at people's faces and making eye contact and looking at whether or not they have direct versus averted gaze. We talked about how we make attributions about other people and then we do this very automatically and perhaps make situational corrections if we are motivated and have the time. We talked about how categorization happens quite automatically. We talked about stereotyping and the stereotype content model. And finally, we've talked about how you might learn stereotypes and how we learn to fear people who are in the out group. So that's all I have for now. And then I'll, of course, continue talking about these topics and more about prejudice in part two in lecture 18. Thanks very much.